<laughs> but the, oh yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Pittsburgh, went to Indiana University, graduated from IU, 7 and 0. Hey, 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 hey. Um, went down to Dallas, but yeah. when I got to Dallas, no connections. I had my buddies from college. And literally I moved in with them. I was the sixth guy living in a three bedroom apartment. I was the guy sleeping on the floor. I had my one towel that I stole from Motel 6. I literally had no closet, nothing. And I, important that is, I mean, I started with nothing. And got a job at night working as a bartender. Then got a job working at a software store where I really, it was there that I really learned about computers. And I was rolling along, living in the hell hole that five with five roommates. And then one day, I had a chance to make a big sale. And part of my responsibilities were to get there early to open up the store, right? I had to sweep the floor, wipe down the windows, open it up. And I called my boss, a guy named Michael. I think he lives in Phoenix now. Um, <laughs> So I'm not going to give you his last name. And um, I'm like, Michael, I got this deal. I'm going to make a $1,500 commission, which was you know, everything to me. And I'm gonna, but I have to go out and pick up this commission check. I have to pick up the check. And I have somebody covered to open up the, door, the store and everything. And can I, I'm going to go do it. And he goes, no. I'm like, what? So I made the executive decision to go out and pick up the check. I get there, fires me. So here I am sleeping on the floor, don't have my $1,500 commission, and I'm like, you know what? That's not the first job I've been fired from. I won't go into the details, but it wasn't the first. <laughs> but I knew I wasn't, I wasn't a good employee, and so it was time to start my own business. So I literally went around to different people who had come into the store and knock on the door, call them, whatever it was, and I finally found one company. I said, look, I got no money, but I know you need this software. If you front me the $500 for this software, if it doesn't work, if I can't make it work, I'll wash, your, I'll wash your car, I'll sweep your floor, I don't care, because I will make it work. And it was a company called Architectural Lighting in Dallas, and they said yes. And from there, I built it from me, to me and somebody, to 80 employees, over seven years, no vacation, up to 30 some million in sales, and sold it to H&R Block. And that was great. It was a $6 million sale. A million of it I gave to all the employees because we were up to 80 employees. The rest of it, taxes, and the rest of it, me. But the reason I tell, and then no, I'll keep on going. So from there, um, about 1995, I got a, one of my buddies from Indiana came to me. He goes, you know what? You know, you were a technology guy. There's this new thing called the internet. And literally, it was a new thing to people back then, right? You remember, I know. <laughs> um, because you were Shark Tank. But, um, <laughs> but he was like, there's got to be a way we can do this. So I went out and bought a Packard Bell computer and put it in the second bedroom of my house. And I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. So we created this company called AudioNet.com. And I literally went to a local radio station. And I said, I'm going to connect this eight-hour VCR, literally a VCR, to their radio station board, if any of you know anything about radio. I would record it take eight hours, go back to my house, and encode it into digital so then I can go on to AudioNet so people can listen to these local Dallas radio stations. And then I would go on Prodigy and AOL and chat rooms and say, hey, if you're anywhere in the world and you want to listen and keep up to date on Dallas sports and news and everything, come to this website. Boom, 100, then 1,000 a day, then 10,000, then we added video, then we went live streaming, and that was the start of the streaming industry. And that's how... That's why you know who I am. That's how I was able to then buy the Mavs, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing about going through that process, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Because we go through this thing that Damon John on Shark Tank calls the power of broke. Right. Where when you have nothing, nothing, literally, I'm eating mustard and ketchup sandwiches. I'm, I gained 20 pounds because I would go to a bar, buy one beer for five bucks, and like every fried mushroom, every, you know, all the junk that they had, I'm like, <laughs> you know, they see me coming like, no, get out. And so, um, but that's the way I got started. And, and, you know, the power of broke just gives you a whole different mindset because you can relate to other entrepreneurs. How many people here are entrepreneurs? I'm guessing most, yeah. And so you all know that, right? You know that feeling you get in your stomach when it's, okay, it's time. You know what it's like, okay, I'm going to take this first step. And the fact that all of you all did it and 99% of people don't, that's special because it makes you understand what it takes. It makes you understand other people's pain. That's why you all can relate to each other. And that's one of the reasons I'm working with Kamala Harris. I should say Kamala. Um, because Kamala Harris. 
because I believe she understands the power of broke. When I talk to her, we talk about small businesses. When I talk to her, like I talk to groups like y'all, it's not about one candidate versus the other. It's how can we make these entrepreneurs more money? That's really what I'm here to talk you, to you about. With Kamala Harris, you can make more money if you're a small business. Now the question is why? And you know what? I'm not going to talk a long time because I want to answer your questions, particularly if you're on the fence and you're undecided, because I want to tell you why. And the first reason why, you know one thing I know about Donald Trump? He doesn't even know what the power of broke means. He's never right. been in that situation. You think he, he ever ate mustard and ketchup sandwiches? You think he ever stayed in a Motel 6, let alone stole a towel from a Motel 6? <laughs> well, he'd be that guy. I mean, he asked daddy for money. Like, no one, there's no origin story. Like, we all know our story. We know day one when we started. We know day two. I remember laying in bed, maybe a little bit hungover, I'm not going to admit to it one way or the other, <laughs> thinking to myself, I've been in business one month. I remember being there three months. I have $15,000 in accounts receivable. That's more money than I'd ever had in my entire life. And that was in receivables. It wasn't cash. But now I had to deliver. But just the idea. Then it was four months. Then it was eight months. Then it was 12 months. And you all know that feeling, right, where you're just counting it because you know any minute of any day it could be gone. Because there's, you know, I always call it the business of sport. Because that's what business is, the ultimate sport. Right? Did I say business? Well, yeah, I'm clockwise. The sport of business, right? Because business is the ultimate sport. You don't know where your competition is coming from. I know when the Suns play the Mavs. You know, it's going to be Book versus Luca. You know, yeah, maybe Book's his son these days, but um, that's a different time. <laughs> oh, you know I had to get that in there. <laughs> if you're into memes, right? <laughs> but... You, the sport of business is there's always going to be some kid. You know, there's some 15-year-old kid here in Phoenix that has just the best idea. And you always know there's somebody there trying to kick your ass. And you always have to be battling. You can't ever let up, can you? There's no let up when you run a small business. Do you think Donald Trump understands that? That's the difference. Because you can talk about him being a business person, but there are business people and then there are entrepreneurs. There are business people, and then there's people who understand the power of broke. And when you understand the power of broke, your decision making is completely different, isn't it? You know, like, let's talk about tariffs. Like, he wants to talk about, I'm going to put up 200, 400, 1,000, 2,000 percent tariffs. <laughs> now, maybe that matters in the way he thinks to Elon Musk. You know, maybe it's because Elon's paying him. I don't know. But for small business, it's a different equation. It's a different story. Because when you think about it, like how many people are in the restaurant business? Anybody here? Right, so there's everything you buy, all your equipment, almost all your equipment is imported, isn't it? It's almost all important. A lot, even alcohol in some cases is important. Food stuffs, your, your, your appliances, your everything. So much of it is important. People don't even realize how much we import from China. But you have to look at it downstream and how it impacts small business. This is actually the literal conversation I've had with Kamala Harris and her team. We talk about this stuff. That's because, like, why were you, is she going to have me? You know, why would, why would she pick me to do this stuff? Because I've lived this. And when we talk about it and we say, okay, if he puts on a 60% tariff from China and all of a sudden, you know, your washing machine prices go up, the detergent prices go up. And that's just from the business side. Because you may be the distributor. Anybody here in the distribution business? OK, one. So you know, do you take any imported products? No? No, OK. So if you did, um, <laughs> but if you did, if you're taking imported products, and there's a 60% tariff, what happens to your costs? Now, when you see a cost at your restaurant or whatever business you're in, and it goes up 60%, are you automatically going to say, that's cool. <laughs> I got no problem with that. Or are you going to have to start budgeting? and starting to make decisions. Now think about how that applies, not just to your type of small business, anybody here in retail? Okay, no, but I'm gonna give, okay, I can see you. Um, <laughs> but just think about it from a retail perspective. We buy clothes, you know, we buy sneakers, we buy um, books, we buy backpacks, we buy all the sporting goods. Just think about this time next year for Christmas, for your own personal Christmas gifts. 
if all of a sudden, God help us, Donald Trump is elected, and he puts 60% tariffs on everything from China. Now all those things cost more because that distributor, that retailer, can't eat all that. Now you're having a second conversation about Christmas, aren't you? Honey, I don't know if we can get that. Now from a small business perspective, who suffers? The person who's selling, the person you buy at the bookstore, the clothing store down the street that you've gotten all your stuff from, you know, the, um, the sporting goods shop that gives you all the, gets you all the merch for your kids' stuff, right? Those are the people who suffer. So when Donald talk, Trump talks about tariffs and he's thinking, oh, you're going to, you know, if we put this big tariff on, all these big companies are going to move their manufacturing from wherever to the United States. How many of you own manufacturing plants in other countries? Look at that, right? Good for you, right? Good for you. Okay, 99.9999% of you don't. But you get my point. It's your families that are suffering. It's the local retailers that are suffering. Even the bigger retailers will suffer. He doesn't care. He probably doesn't even understand. Donald Trump is the Grinch that's trying to steal your Christmas as a retailer because you know, three quarters of your business, or at least a, half, a quarter of your business comes in the end of the year, the final quarter. And if you're selling to small businesses, and if you're a restaurant, people having more or less money, honey, are we going to go out to eat? Are we going to order in? Or are we going to use that money for presents? That's what tariffs do. It is not about big companies. It's about small companies. Do you think he's paid any attention to that? Have you heard anybody in the mainstream media talk about any of this? That's why I'm here. That's the conversation I have with Kamala Harris. I'm not going to lie. Kamala Harris isn't like an experienced business person. She's smart. She's open-minded. She's, she's not an ideologue. She's open to all ideas. She doesn't care. If I'm an independent. I'm not here to tell you about all the other races. I'm here to tell you how you can make more money under Kamala Harris than you would under Donald Trump. So I'm not here as a politician. Right? She asks, and she's looking for ways to help you. To ways to really help you make more money. She's not, now, everybody's going to ask her, well, there's tariffs in place, right? Why didn't she get rid of the tariffs that are already in place? Well, because there's strategic tariffs, and then there's across-the-board tariffs. Strategic tariffs, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and so there's U.S. steel. There's a strategic imperative that we have somebody in our country able to make steel, able to make cars. But if you just do across-the-board tariffs, that's just insanity. That is literally stupid. You know, and by the way, if you go back and look at Donald Trump's old stuff, he talked about it relatively sanely back in the 90s and early 2000s, but he's taken the, Dew. he just, now he just rambles and he mentions tariffs. You know, how are you going to fix childcare? Tariffs, you know. <laughs> What'd you have for lunch? Tariffs. <laughs> yeah, they put 2,000% ketchup on my tariff, you know. It's insane. So Donald Trump isn't just there thinking, OK, I'm this business guy. He's never felt the fear. And you cannot be a business person that helps anybody else unless you felt the fear. And Kamala Harris may not have been a business person, but she has felt the fear. Growing up in Oakland, California, being a, having a single parent, right, M moving around. Her mom was a scientist and learning, working at McDonald's. I'm not saying she was destitute, but she understands the uncertainty of how are you going to pay for college. So when we talk about Donald, Donald Trump, the business person, it has nothing to do with you or I. Now, the second thing is we talk about inflation. Now, Donald Trump talks about drill, baby, drill. Well, have you seen the price of oil? It's about 70 bucks. And if everybody, everybody just dives in and drills, 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 you know what's going to happen to the price of oil? Woo! Right? Which means they're not going to all just dive in and drill baby drill. And we've seen that before. So he turns around and says, we're going to drill baby drill, and that's going to cut the cost of all goods. It will not cut the cost of all goods. I think um, one of the, a Fox interviewer actually asked him, you know, how can you explain that? And he just changed the subject because it doesn't work that way. Yes, the price of energy goes into cost of everything that we make at some level, but people aren't going backwards. Look, that doesn't mean the inflation we suffered is good. And, you know, we can go into all the details of what creates inflation and how far back it goes. And I can make the argument that when Donald Trump went to Saudi Arabia, Arabia and Russia in um, April, of, of, yeah, April of 2020, 
um, right as the pandemic was started and got them to um, reduce their production, that started the price of gas going up. And that started the price of other products going up. And if you follow that, that it wasn't a treaty, but if you follow that agreement, when that agreement ends, that's when that 9.1% inflation started to go do 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 So he was more worried then about his oil company buddies than he was about everybody. Because if he hadn't done that, the price of gas, remember during the beginning of the pandemic when it just dropped to next to nothing? If he hadn't done that, the price of gas would have stayed where it was. But he did it. Because again, he's never felt the power broke. He's never been there. He's never had to worry about it. He's never had to think twice about it. But we have to deal with inflation. And do, going against, you know, doing the drill baby drill, again, part of his insanity. I think he used to understand it, but I don't know that he does. And on top of that, you know, it's a global marketplace. We produce maybe 19%, I forget, of energy. I forget the exact amount. But the other 80% or so, they have a say in what the price is. And that's why OPEC's such a big deal. We don't have control of those prices like he seems to think. So how do we deal with it as small businesses? Well, one of the other terrors we all have, how many of you here have a real problem with your health care costs? It's terrifying, isn't it? Because on one hand, you're trying to compete because, you know, so-and-so could go work for somebody else who has full health care benefits. And as a small company, it's, it's like if somebody gets sick. So you help them, and maybe you do something with Cigna or Aetna, and, but their deductibles are enormous, aren't they? And even with the ACA, deductibles, if you're you know, not the best plan, it's still high. Now listen to what Kamala has said. And I have this company, costplusdrugs.com, and we've introduced transparency, and we've seen the price of medications drop significantly. And Kamala and her team, to her credit, has looked at all that. And you've heard her talk about these things called pharmacy middlemen, the pharmacy benefit managers. They're responsible for jacking up a lot of cost of medications. Other middlemen on the healthcare side, responsible of jacking up the cost of healthcare. What is she doing? Well, there's the ACA and there's other programs she's looking at and improving them, but just introducing transparency. If she can get just a transparent program passed in Congress, you know what happens to your cost of medications? Boom, down by 20, 30%. Just by removing those pharmacy middlemen. And the same thing with the big insurance companies. Anybody like dealing with the big insurance companies? Anybody had to fight them for PREOS? She's working to get rid of PREOS or at least reduce them to make them sane. And so when we talk about, we talk about inflation, which is more stressful for you as, as an entrepreneur? Dealing with, okay, I raised my prices a little bit, I didn't like it, um, and maybe I'm caught up, maybe I'm ahead, maybe I'm a little bit behind, but it's, it's getting back to close, right? We, we had that initial shock, but we're getting there. Or the terror of healthcare. Healthcare or where it was? Am I right or am I, am I off? So that's where Kamala is. That's how I think she is. And look, let me just say really clearly, I don't speak for the campaign, right? I'm here. They don't, I tell them they're not allowed to tell me what to say. <laughs> and they get mad wherever they are. Um, <laughs> and wait till you hear what I have to say next before we get to questions. <laughs> it gets a lot crazier. Um, but this is what I believe because I've talked to their team. You know, Donald Trump stands up and he talks, da 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 da, sharks. Da 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 da, not us sharks. But just, just, let me tell you one quick question, one, one quick thing, speaking of sharks and Donald Trump. So, look, I'm an American first, and I wasn't happy when he got elected, but they invited me to the White House to talk about healthcare and some of the things that I'm doing. And he really wasn't into talking about healthcare, but as we were finishing up, he goes, Are you still on that show, Shark Tank? I'm like, Yeah. He goes, Baron loves that show. I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> Where was I? Um, but with healthcare, we'll get you there, and we'll start reducing those costs. And that's how you deal with inflation, which is going to save you more money. If I can cut your healthcare costs, if we're able to get that program and put together, let's say get it together first, and introduce a program that cuts your healthcare costs by 20%, would that offset everything from inflation? And then some, right? Because as an entrepreneur, that's terrifying, because it's cascading impact. Because if your employee, and again, Donald doesn't get this because he doesn't know the power of broke. He's never had to face that, well, if somebody gets sick, you know, then they can't show up. Or if they can't get their pre-authorization done, and then they have to stay home with the kid, and I'm calling the insurance company instead of doing my job. And so he's never had to deal with that. So if we can get all that passed, then we're in a whole different position. And that's what I'm working with with Kamala Harris. 
She understands that. She knows that for small business, it, that shit truly does, oh, I'm sorry, well, it really does <laughs> come down on top of an, every entrepreneur's head. Because whose responsibility is it for everything in your company? It's your responsibility. Nobody, there's, you know, I can't tell you, even to this day with Cost Plus, you get, there's something that happens, and you're like, oh my God, I gotta figure this out. Yeah. And you can talk to your spouse, and you can vet, you know, and you can go have a drink, but you have to solve that problem. Yeah. But sometimes you have a great partner. Somebody who listens, who's open-minded, who doesn't come in and say they're an expert, but they will listen to your ideas and solutions. That's why I've been able to partner with Kamala and her team. She's a great listener. She understands that for small business, all these things matter, that he's not paying attention to any of these things. Okay, so now I'm gonna piss him off, right? Um, we can talk a little bit about immigration, but I wanna talk about deportation. Look, my opinion, they screwed up on immigration. And I think they did it from the right place. I think sometimes you open the door and too many kids walk in. And in this particular case, I think their heart was in the right place, but just too many people came through the door and they had to change it and they did. And you saw the programs, you saw the executive order, you saw her saying, you know, the border bill she's going to sign and that will continue to hopefully keep all that in check. And then she said, like Donald Trump, if there's somebody, a non-citizen with a criminal record, she's just gonna get rid of them. She's gonna deport them, okay? And she was very open and straightforward about that. And I don't think a lot of people have a problem with that. But here, and again, I'll tie it to small business. The hard part isn't that. The hard part is everybody that works for you who has been here 5, 10, 15 years and is just a great person and maybe has some uncertainty, maybe on their immigration status or even more likely someone in their family. Now, we know that Kamala Harris is going to be real. She's going to tell you, here's the process. If you've got a blemish on your record, you might have to go out and come back in. But you're going to know it going in. If we need to get you help for your immigration status, here's the programs, right? You may not like it, but she's going to tell you what you have to do. Donald Trump, any of you all remember Elian Gonzalez? Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone show, where's the restaurant owners? Can you imagine somebody showing up to your manager or your door and saying, I need the home addresses of everybody who works for you so we can check their immigration status? Is that what we want? No? Is there anybody here who can say that's not going to happen? No. He's got people like Stephen Miller, who he loves. Michael Flynn, who he loves. What do you think Stephen Miller would do? Stephen Miller would be like, militarize you know, the local police, grab them, get their ass back to wherever. That's not who we are as Americans, but think about it for your business. It's hard enough to staff your business, isn't it? It's hard enough to keep people coming to work and dealing with everything. It's hard enough when they have problems at home with health care or school or whatever it may be, isn't it? Because their problems are your problems. That's somebody who understands the power of broke because you've been there. Donald Trump doesn't give a shit, up, doesn't give a stuff damn about any of that. <laughs> Literally, I'm not saying this is going to happen tomorrow, but there's a greater, much, much, much greater chance than zero that this happens. And that's going to impact each and every one of you. And that's directly why I'm supporting Kamala Harris. She understands the power of broke. She understands small business. She is going to help you make more money. Okay, so now I got time for questions. If, if you're an um, undecided or Trump supporter, please, I want to hear from you. I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up for her speech. And one of the things she talked about, she said the Empire State Building was built in one year. And there were other um, examples she gave where they were built in like time that you can't even imagine it only took that long. And one of the first things she's talked about was reducing the friction for permitting and reducing the friction for licensing and working with the states to do that. So that's one small step to reducing. Then I literally have asked her the question, is there spending that we can cut? She says yes. Now she's not giving me the individual things, but when you see Elon Musk say, okay, he's gonna be the director of efficiency, great. <laughs> No, no, look, it's, it's great. We need a director. I don't have a problem with that.
Americans that don't have an, an end date. Well, that, but see, that's the thing. She's not an ideologue. Yeah. This is not about, this is what the progressives think. This is what the Republicans think. It's about what's the solution. You always see her, hear her talking about problem solving. This is a problem. She always hears saying, I'm going to put a Republican in my cabinet. I want to hear from Republicans, independents like me, Democrats, whoever has solutions, that's who she wants to hear from. So spending matters. But when it comes to printing money, oh, there's a lot of arguments in a lot of different directions. But she is not going to tell the Federal Reserve what to do. Now, the bigger the deficit, the more they end up having to print. So she is definitely talking about where you can cut the deficit. But the best way to reduce the deficit is to grow. And let me just tell you, when you support small businesses, you already know that, I saw a figure, and this is insane, 82% of businesses created in 2023 were from the Hispanic community. 82%. 62% of growth for new job growth comes from small business. There are 33 plus million businesses in this country. 99.5% of them are small businesses. And 98%, give or take, are pass-through companies, right? And so by supporting those companies and making it so, you know, I hope all of you make more, hundred, more than $400,000, but for those that don't, your taxes aren't going up or probably are going down. So that means small business, 99.99, give or take, 90, let's say 98% of small business owners aren't going to see their taxes go up. They're going to see them go down. That's pro-growth. And so we can cut costs on one side, and we can grow our way out of it on the other side. But you need somebody who understands the power of broke to be able to listen to and hear the feedback from small businesses. It's not just about large businesses. There are only, oh my goodness, um, the 20,000 companies with 500 or more employees. Where do you think Donald Trump puts his emphasis? The 33 million or the 20,000? And the 33 million have a lot to do with you know, the GDP and everything here, and so does the 20,000. But you, you can grow your way out of this. And if you don't do stupid shit like tariffs, and you don't you know, have, create um, unrest in the country through a deportation policy, then I think we can grow our way out. And you can ask a follow-up question if you'd like. No, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. And um, I'm just grateful that we're considering all the, you know, sure. I all the alternatives. Look, yeah. You hear what I've had to say. Because partisanism is going to kill us faster than anything. That, 100%, right, 100%. But everything I've said here, I've said to her. Yeah. Maybe, okay, I lied. To her or her close team. They're sick of me, basically. <laughs> like, ESOP, all this stuff, right? Talking about, she talked a little bit about ESOP programs. One of the things I'm most proud about, when I sold a chunk of the Mavs, I paid out $50 million in bonuses. When I sold Broadcast.com, I paid... 300 out of 330 employees became millionaires. When I sold that first company I told you about on Shark Tank. Uh, so to me, employee stock ownership programs are critically important because that's how you defeat income inequality. Because when everybody owns stocks and business, that's an appreciable asset. That and homes. And so, and obviously you've, you've heard of programs for homes. So pushing an ESOP program that makes it easier and better and simpler for you guys to share equity with your employees that's what changes the game. So I'm having all these conversations. Trust me, I'm not shy. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. You can't, you can't always get entrepreneurs to engage with politics because we're busy reacting to it. Yeah. How do we get the conversation at a high level to include more of the, the ground level participation mm -hmm. and get a sense of what really is happening from up in the clouds? Meaning what's... So you understand better what's happening at Kamala's level? and Yeah, you know, what, what decisions are being made there? Right. Well, that's why I'm here. How it affects up. Right, that's why I'm here. Because, you know, well, I'll tell you one idea I gave her. Like I said, they're, they're so annoyed with my ideas. Um, but to, to his point, that there are so many online tools available that it's like if you go on Reddit, you can do an Ask Me Anything, that it's not very difficult to set up a site so that you can have topical conversations and have people within the um, administration come up with, give you answers. Because I, I agree with you, right? The, the more transparency in, in ideation, right, in coming up with ideas, the smarter we all are, and the less we have to be concerned. And so, again, th but that goes to the open-mindedness of Kamala Harris. That goes to not being an ideologue, that she's open to all ideas. And that's why, you know, even after giving her that idea, I'm still here, you know, because she wants to hear those ideas. And so, if you have anything, you know, Learn it out, you know, get it to the campaign. 
because she's, she's not saying no, you know, she's just, how do you do it the best way? And best way right now is surrogates like myself coming out here and answering questions and trying to be, give direct answers, and then we can go from there. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. With people who are undecided in the business sector, and they're having a problem with uh, efficacy or integrity of information when uh -huh. trying to make decisions like this, because as a couple gentlemen have said, the partisan thing has become It's hard, a, yeah. You don't know what's problem. true and what's not, yeah. For business owners who are undecided and trying to make that decision, where can people get information You're where there's some integrity <laughs> to it and they don't have to question whether or not they're yeah, being hard. strung along for partisan purpose? Yeah, it's hard. So I, what I try to do is I, I actually read people's speeches. And I try to read it not in their voice. So I want to know what they're saying is if somebody else, is if you were reading it to me. So that I know, so I try to get the substance, if there is any, and the content. And honestly, there is a leap of faith at some level because you, the goal is to win. And when you're trying to win, you can't get into details on every single subject, particularly when you just came in, you know, 110 whatever days ago. And you're trying to go from, think about this, right? They talk about Donald Trump, the salesman. The, the, he's been doing this for nine years. He's been campaigning forever. And here's this woman who steps in, hundred some days ago with negative favorables with you know he would, even he would say nobody knows who Kamala Harris is and now worst case even right here as we speak we're tied the idea that she's come that far and that says something like it says a lot to me character is destiny and ethics matter and I just don't see that from from Donald Trump and so I tend to have a more critical eye because that's the partisanship when I look at Trump, but I also know that we talked about Shark Tank. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, Barbara Corcoran, one of the sharks, she had the biggest real estate um, company in New York City. Donald Trump had a um, condo conversion and he asked her, he wasn't selling, and he asked her to sell it. She killed it, sold everything that she committed to sell. He owed her $4 million. He wouldn't pay. She had to sue him and she won. And the, the content of the lawsuit was he had to pay her $55,000 a month, but that's not the best part. Barbara being the amazing, amazing, amazing entrepreneur and woman that she is, every time she would send the check, or every time she got the check from Donald Trump for the $55,000, she would send him a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> and every time he got the bouquet of flowers, he would send them back. <laughs> that's how petty he is, but look, you can go to Trump University, you can go to Trump Soho, you can go to Trump Foundation, you can go to Trump Chicago, you can just go online. So when he was doing his um, New York trial, and put aside whether you think it's lawfare, should have been, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, so, and you know, you know which one I'm talking about, right? And so it was about his loan documents. I mean, if you're supposedly a billionaire, why the hell do you lie about your income and property values on a loan application? But anyways, I digress. Um, there was a, a portion where Michael Cohen was testifying. And he's standing up there and he says, yeah, Mr. Trump asked me to underpay certain vendors. And I did, and he was proud of me. And he's saying that right in front of Donald Trump. The, was Donald Trump shaking his head? He was smiling. And you know how he goes out and he did his little impromptu t press conference after the fact, right? Did he say, that's not true? No, we talked about the judge and all the nonsense he talks. If somebody short paid you at your business, would you vote for them as dog catcher? Yeah. No. That's, this is a habit for this guy. Trump University, he had to pay out $25 million because it was a, a sham university. That's who he is. So when you go through that partisan lens, particularly now with memes, because it's such a shortcut in some respects. You see these memes coming across Instagram, you don't know what's true or what's not. Um, but if you read what he says, and you look at his history, and you look at his character. And to me, it's just insane that people ignore January 6th. Like, yeah, it was a fun day. Isn't that what he said? You know, it's the day of love. That's what he said. The day of love. Yeah, let's, you know, this Woodstock, right? The day of love. Let's take our blankets and break into the Capitol. Come on, man. You know, so that was my little Obama thing. Um, <laughs> but, um, so to answer your question, you always are going to have to make decisions because it's hard to get the exact information. And there's a lot of fluff. There's fluff from Kamala. There's fluff from Donald. 
And you have to know that, in my mind, character is destiny. Because the one thing about the presidency that's like being an entrepreneur, you don't know what's happening tomorrow. He has no idea what comes next. And do you want somebody who would short pay a vendor? Do you want somebody who would call January 6th a day of love? You know, that when, I mean, think about it. If there was anybody, if you just happened to be sitting in the White House one day, and somebody said about somebody that works for you, hang, let's, let's just say the guy who works for you is named Mike Pence, right? <laughs> And there's somebody who works for you, and the people outside the office are going, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike. What would you do? You would be right there. That's my guy. Thick or thin, that's my guy. I may not agree with you, that's my guy. Have you ever heard him say that about anybody? So when it comes to making the, the decisions and the uncertainty, because there's the filters may or may not be there, and you have to look through memes and, you know, a right-wing website versus a left-wing website. But character is destiny. Remember who he is and what he's done or let happen to the people he supposedly cared about because he'll do the same thing to the voters he doesn't care about. Let's talk some more about his little bit, real quick, right? Um, so when Donald Trump starts talking about tariffs, one of the things he said, I keep on pointing at you, sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the things he says is, this is a negotiating tactic. Well, this isn't the first time you tried this negotiating tactic, right? You did it before. Do you think China is stupid? So what they've been doing literally is going to other countries, buying up factories, moving their processes and robotics and stuff over there so that he, they can say, okay, you can tariff us all you want. We got you in India. We got you in Taiwan, whatever it may be. Um, and so they're already ahead of the game on that. But once he starts talking about it during his negotiation period, like I started to say earlier, everybody starts hoarding. Everybody starts taking capital. So, hey, I can invest in hiring more people. I can invest in a new location. But, oh, my God, my cooler is, like, on its last leg, and I was planning on Biden on the next three months. But if this tariff comes in, the cost of my cooler is going to go up 50%, and then my maintenance costs are already too high, and the guy jacking up. Right? So you get the point. So people take money that was already set for what they were going to do in their business and try to get ahead of the tariffs. And whoever they were going to buy, whoever you were going to buy your new cooler from, that distributor now is saying, oh, my God. Name of the restaurant? Namaste in There you go. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Always sell it. Namaste is not buying that cooler they committed to buy from us because of the tariffs. So that cascading effect impacts your business a lot. Yeah, it's already very expensive, yes. Yeah. yeah, and you don't need it to go up anymore. So again, if we're going to break free of the partisanship and the distortion of information, you want somebody who's not an ideologue. You don't want somebody, you, don't, you do not hear Kamala Harris say, this is the progressive way or this is center, or this is right. You hear her say, I am going to solve a problem. How often have you heard her say that? We are looking forward and taking, look, going forward to solve a problem. We're not looking back at all, you know, what's already been done and what has been and what can be, I, you know, I don't know, the whole, but um, you're supposed to laugh. But, <laughs> but you get my point, you know, that it takes time, but you need somebody who is open-minded, who is analytic, who is smart, who, again, is not an ideologue, because that's how you solve problems. As entrepreneurs, you know if you go in with a preconceived notion, almost always you're wrong. You've got to have an open mind to say, this has changed, because context always changes when you're an entrepreneur. Always. Stuff always changes. And so, this, you know, again, that's why I'm here for Kamala Harris, because she has an open mind. She knows things are going to change. And she's not saying, you know, what'd you have for dinner? Tariffs. You know, what'd you have for lunch? Immigration. <laughs> what are you going to do for childcare? Immigration in, in tariffs. <laughs> you know? Just sure. quick question. What about capital gains tax? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. So some people think that there is going to be an unrealized gains tax on capital gains. There is not. There is not. Where that came from was Joe Biden put out a budget proposal um, for last year, for 2024, this year, um, that included that. Because, and look, when I saw that, I went ballistic. Because that's an economy killer. Kamala knows that. You haven't heard her talk about it. Has she said a word 
but but you'll see like somebody went on CNBC that used to work for Elizabeth Warren and said that that's what they were supporting one time. Let me just tell you, you have not seen that person again. <laughs> I can't say any more. <laughs> Okay, but you get my point, right? There is no tax on unrealized capital gains. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be places she looks. Like if, if you make, you know, if you're in the highest tax bracket going from 37 to 39, we're blessed. You know, that's okay. 21 to 28 percent, you can make an argument in both directions, but let me just tell you, 21 percent plus tariffs cost a whole lot more than 28 percent with no tariffs. 28 percent on capital gains, compare that to what Joe Biden wanted. You need to reduce the deficit somehow, you know, and we've seen that just lower taxes, lower taxes across the board. Here's, here's something else, right, and I'm gonna, then we'll take this one question. Look, probably five years ago um, at the Mavs and with the arena, I found out that a couple of our employees were on public assistance. They were on SNAP and some other things. I didn't know which ones. I didn't want to know. I was embarrassed as F. <laughs> To me, there's nothing more embarrassing than having somebody who works for me, someone as wealthy and blessed as I am, that wasn't making enough money to not be on public assistance. Because to me, not only was it embarrassing for that reason, but it meant all of you were subsidizing my employees. How wrong is that? <laughs> so when he talks about lowering you know, sub, um, C Corp taxes, basically, because we're not talking about pass-through companies. When he talks about that for the biggest 20,000 companies, is he saying anything about the employees? What he's saying is, you'll make more money. You can put more money in your pocket if the tax rates are a little bit lower. But they're okay, he's okay, if your employees are getting paid by me and you and all of us to pay taxes. How wrong is that? That is so wrong. Taxpayers should not be subsidizing those 20,000 big companies who don't pay enough. That's just wrong. <laughs> so you're not going to see a, a tax on capital gains. And look, let me just say, if I'm wrong, okay, I'm going to tell you if I'm wrong, she's going to hate to hear this. I'll work it so she doesn't get elected again. Because that's how wrong I think that is. So, but I already know it's not going to happen, so i just like to say that to sound dramatic. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you. I needed that. Other question. Yes, sir. Wait. Hi. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Jasmine. I'm Hi, Jasmine. a nurse, and I'm the CEO and founder of Navi Nurses. Nice. Which is a And you're smart enough startup. to wear your logo on your T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Where's Namaste? Learn something from Navi Nurses. <laughs> we have a lot to teach you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So first of all, thank you so much for being here and taking your time. Um, one thing, as a healthcare provider, healthcare is incredibly important to me. Yes. It's something that I hope to see continue that um, we place at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, and just a message from my heart, um, if you can pass along to Kamala. I will. Watching <laughs> devastation in other parts of the world, it was really hard to see my colleagues suffering. I know that there's things we can and cannot do, but just... I would like to appreciate the fact that maybe she can take that forward and make the change that I think human beings We'll cut this deserve. out and make sure she gets that video. Yeah, perfect. And then, um, you know, as a female founder, you know, two to three percent of all funding goes to female-led yeah, yeah. female companies. And so I would just love to know, in your opinion, how do you think having a minority female as president how can that transform entrepreneurship for women just like me and, and every other woman in our community? Obviously, I think it's fucking, yeah. Yes, yeah. Put your earmuffs on. I think it's fucking amazing, right? I, you know, um, it does, it, it, it is a step. If you go to markcuban.com, you'll see the companies that I've invested in, and you'll see the number of minority CEOs and minority founders and women founders, and the fact that it's important. You've got to start somewhere, and you've got to grow, and I know it's, it's very important to Kamala, and I know um, we've had those, those conversations, and, you know, her programs show it, and more, more happens, but, yeah, I think, and I can tell you, and look, I love Kevin, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank, but even he will tell you that his best performing companies are female entrepreneurs. Yeah. Can, I, can, uh -huh. I, can I just tell you real quick? So actually, 
I applied to be on the show and I declined it. But I'd love to talk to I you. I have after. nothing to do with that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I chose not to, but I'd love to connect afterwards. You got it. Yes, sir, right here, right here. Last question. Right here. Mark, thank you for being here for My the pleasure. Uh, Arizona entrepreneur community and for Harris. My question is, will you continue to be there Oh, once yes. President you Harris say, gets elected? Yeah, so my goal, I don't want a job. I got plenty of jobs, right? Cosplusdrugs.com is my thing, and I want to truly change healthcare. Um, but you have my commitment that I am with her. Look, if I could show you on my phone how many times I text her husband, her team, you know, I don't text her directly because it, she doesn't see it anyways. So just, <laughs> just through everybody, and I, I've committed to them that I will be there because this is important. This is how we get out of a deficit by growing our way out, having somebody that understands the power of broke, that's not a bureaucrat, that's not political, that just wants to see this, com this country continue to be the amazing country it is. And so you guys have my commitment. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'll stay there. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time.